And when you say it would have been five, pretty much, uh, like, what do you mean by that? The one of the bullets hit the pendant that I was wearing, mm. and it's crazy because I didn't realize how small the pendant was until I started telling you about it. You know, in in on um, Instagram. So yeah. here is the pendant I was wearing that night, and That's crazy. here is a penny. That's crazy. What is up, everybody, and welcome back to the podcast today. We got a very special episode for you guys. So we have this young lady coming on the podcast who has been paralyzed for over 20 years. So her story is very emotional, you guys, as you are about to hear. And I just wanted to tell you thank you for everybody that comes onto the podcast and shares your story because I know how personal that it may be. So to each and every one of you, I just want to tell you thank you, and I hope you guys enjoy. All right, then. Let's dive into it, though. Okay. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. You doing good? Okay. Yeah, I'm right, nervous, man. but I'm good. You nervous? Why? Why are you nervous? Oh, because it's the first time, like I said, I've ever spoken about the shooting okay. in my memory. I don't think mm-hmm. people realize that. I remember so much more than, mm-hmm. like, I should. Okay. You know, and I was in shock through most of it. It's like, mm-hmm. my body was numb, but... Mm-hmm. Okay. I could still remember seeing everything as it went down. Okay. Okay. And just to kind of help you out, I'm probably more nervous than you are. Every look, every podcast <laughs> I do, I'm I'm super nervous. All right? Like I'm literally super nervous, but I guess whenever y'all jump into the video, I guess kind of everything kind of like, you know, like I don't know, like just eases up in there, you know. Everybody I've, you know, spoken to has actually been, like, really cool. Everybody's been really chill. So, you know, like, the podcast just really just flows. So, yeah. Yeah. So, all right, then. Okay. So, uh, uh, before we get into everything, you know, just go ahead and tell us a little bit about you. Like, who was you before your incident? Like, uh, like what you uh, like to end? Uh, like, was you into any sports or, like, I don't know. Like, just tell us some interesting stuff about you. Before the shooting, as a person, I was that little girl that, I guess I was more of a tomboy. I okay. grew I grew up around mostly uncles that were close mm-hmm. in age, the youngest being just eight years apart from me. Oh, okay. um, so I guess that's why I kind of gave off the tom- tomboy vibe. So I was always mm-hmm. riding my bike, climbing trees, mm-hmm. um, just getting into stuff, pretty much. Um Okay. I know one of my uncles had joined um, the military. So mm. growing up, it's like that was what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to join the military. I wanted to be just like my uncle. Okay. Okay. And if you don't mind me asking, what branch did he join? Army. The Army? Okay. Yeah. And what branch did you want to join? Army. I ain't going to be mad. I ain't going to be, oh, you want to join? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I was in the Air Force. So. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, did you play any sports? Do any cheerleading? Um, football? And no, I was so young. No? Um, okay. No. Okay. Okay. And and then for the people out there watching, how old was you when you got paralyzed? Eight years old. Eight years old. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So as of today, you're gonna be. I was. You're gonna I'm, be the youngest person I've interviewed. Yeah. That, yeah. They got into a wheelchair that young. Uh, before yeah. that, it was somebody who, you know, she was only thirteen. So just, I don't know, I, just hearing, just hearing that you got paralyzed at eight years old is it's kind of tough because it kind of brings in a little bit more than, you know, somebody who got paralyzed at twenty two because, at eight years old, you know, you you pretty much went through elementary school, middle school, and high school in a wheelchair. Yeah. So you're gonna be able to give us insight on all that, you know. So, okay. Okay, now, did you know anybody that was in a wheelchair before? No. Uh, before your incident? No. No? Okay. Okay. And what state was you living in at the time? Uh, Texas. Texas. Okay. Yeah. Big state. I like Texas. I used to live there for a year. For a year. Really? I was stationed in San Antonio. Really? That's where I'm from? Yeah. Oh, for real? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I was at Shriver Air Force Base for a year. So, I, I mean, uh, not Shriver, uh, Lackland. Lackland, my bad. Lackland, yeah, that's yeah, Lackland. Not far from where I'm at right now. Okay, okay, I'm yeah, it's yeah, San Antonio wild. <laughs> I like it out there though. It, it was nice. I haven't been back since, but I had a good time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, getting into that day, how was your day going? 
and I would say to the best of your ability, because you were only eight years old at the time. So no, you know, actually, to the I best of your remember, ability, how I can remember the night before the shooting, like oh. what I was doing. Um, I remember that one of my uncles had just had a baby. So we were actually mm. at the hospital that okay. night. And um, I remember getting home and falling asleep in the living room watching TV. Mm. Okay. You know what you watched? No, I don't remember. So, get into that day. Did the shooting happen in the morning or in the afternoon? It was at two o'clock in the morning. Oh, oh, two o'clock in the morning. So at nighttime, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. So okay. Okay. So if you don't mind me asking, what was you doing out that late, or was no, you out that I, late, or was it? No, I fell asleep on my grandmother's couch. Oh. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Let me. All right. All right, all right, see, I ain't know that. Okay. Okay, so that kind of, that definitely changes things. Okay. Yeah. So when you say that you remember the night before, was was that the night before where you fell asleep on the couch and then that's yeah, when it happened leading into yeah. it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, so to be honest, just diving right into it, just tell us what happened. Well, I know my grandmother has told me um, that she had happened to get up to go to the bathroom. Mm, okay. And she just heard the gunshots and her instinct was to go grab me because I was in the living room. Yeah. And um, she said that I didn't, I didn't wake up. Like I wasn't crying or nothing. I think I just straight up went into shock. The moment that like my memory um, came mm. back was when she pulled me off the couch but for some reason i couldn't move so my grandmother had to drag me from the living room all the way into the kitchen um you know to get me away from the gunshots um i remember seeing my one of my uncles just run right past me because you know somebody had yelled that they were shooting up the house mm-hmm. and um I know my grandmother put me over her shoulder and she was just covered in blood. Damn. Um. Just fine. And yeah, um, I remember um, falling asleep and then I woke up again and they had me under like a whole bunch of um, blankets because um, yeah. the paramedics still hadn't gotten there. I woke back up again. I remember having my uncle on my left side and um, we happened to have like a priest that lived at the corner um, of the block and he had ran toward the house after the shooting stopped. So he was on my right side okay. and he was the only one that was able to notice that I had a gunshot wound to my back. The only wounds that anybody had seen were the ones to the legs. Oh, um, so, okay. So, Mm. Yeah. I was lucky, though, because the bullets didn't hit any bone. They just went, like, straight through the leg, but didn't hit, like, any bone. Yeah. Any any bone. Okay, so pretty much just, like, flesh wounds, then? Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, so in total, how many times was you hit? Four times, but it would have been five. Mm. Um, and, when, and when you say it would have been five, pretty much, uh, what do you mean by that? The one of the bullets hit the pendant that I was wearing, mm. and it's crazy because I didn't realize how small the pendant was until I started telling you about it, you know, in in on um, Instagram. So yeah. here is the pendant I was wearing that night, and that's crazy. Here is a penny. That's crazy, and the. Cra- and what's so crazy about that? Do you know what carry gold that is? No, I don't. Mm, I would, to be honest, I would say most Spanish people buy fourteen carry gold. Um, <laughs> trust, trust me, I don't know why. I don't know why, but we all buy fourteen carry gold. Um, and the crazy thing about it is that gold is really soft. Yeah, gold gold is really soft. So to to know that a bullet stopped that is is. It's crazy, like it, it's crazy. And then the other thing is that, you know, when you look at a, a bullet, when most people look at bullets, 
that's not the bullet that actually goes inside you. The bullet, the bullet is actually a lot smaller. Yeah. So, damn, that's crazy. That's that's crazy. Oof. That's wild. Okay, so when you said that you were sleeping on the couch, is that was the couch a place that you normally went to sleep at? Yeah, because I would always fall asleep watching TV. Okay. Okay. Now, at at the time, was you living with your grandmother? Yes, we had a house. Um, okay. So it was my mom, my uncles, my aunt, and okay. then my grandma. Okay. But the house, um, it's like I've been back as an adult, and mm-hmm. the bullets, I don't know exactly anything about guns, but I know that the bullets that they used to shoot up our house went through walls, mm-hmm. like from the front of the house all the way to the back. Yeah, bullet. The crazy thing about bullets is, you know, sometimes whenever they hit something, they 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 don't stop. They they literally just keep going, and sometimes they just they just find ways around things, through things. It's it's really crazy to see how a bullet can really travel and just do so much damage sometimes. Yeah, you know, because I'm pretty sure that the bullet that hit you didn't it didn't just hit you first. It probably went through something and then hit you. Yeah, pretty much all four of them. Five of them yeah. in reality. So, okay. Okay. So, to the so, best of your ability, was you in any pain? Um, no. Well, I know that they had said that I was just complaining that my stomach hurt. But that that was it. Um, but going back to that night, um, I had my uncle on my left side. And I remember him, you know, telling me for me to stay awake, for me not to go to sleep. Mm-hmm. And we started counting down from 100. I got to 99, 96, and I just passed out. Mm-hmm. My mom wasn't home the night of the shooting. Um, so as the paramedics were getting there, that's when I wake back up and I see my mom, like, you know, there. Um, I can't remember if she was screaming or anything, but I remember mm-hmm. being in the ambulance awake. And, you know, usually they put... Um, somebody like in the front of the Mm -hmm. next to the driver and um, I just remember I kept looking up through the little window and I would see my mom just looking at me yeah um I remember getting to the hospital and seeing you know the bright lights and stuff like that um from the hospital and I think at that point I didn't realize that I was shot but I remember screaming yeah um And I don't really remember uh, much after that until I actually woke up. But I will say that one thing that is really weird is, um, you know, I, you know, mentioned things to my grandmother about like my memory and and stuff like that. And um, she told me that I had died on the table. I'd lost so much blood. I'd lost so much blood. They didn't think that I was going to make it. Yeah. And I know that, you know, from your videos, there was a guy that had said that he saw, like, light or something. Mm -hmm. Um, I saw the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, But it it was just, it was weird because it's like, I was in the room with my family, but they couldn't see me. I can see, I could see who was there. I could see who was covered in blood. And then for some reason, I ended up back at the house. So so, do you feel like it was kind of like an out of body experience? Yeah. Oh, okay. Damn. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So, at the time, at the time that you feel like this out of body experience happening, like, is that is that before or after the white lights? Um, it was after. It was after the white lights. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so probably by this time you're probably, you're like you might be in surgery. You probably just on all types of medications that you don't even know, just all types of IVs and stuff. So that's kind of where I would say, like after talking to so many people, I would probably say that that's probably where it comes from because, you know, I feel like that at, in that moment your body is like, it's fighting to survive. But I don't know, it probably just wants to put you, I, like, I don't know. It's just. I don't know. It's it's it, it's weird because I hear so many different stories, 
as far as like you know stuff like that and I don't like I don't know just not all of them are the same but some of them are just it makes sense but then sometimes it doesn't make sense yeah if you know what I mean yeah uh, because because for me for me and this is one thing I've never actually gotten into um when everything happened with me I thought I got out the car so I thought I I thought I got out the car and I thought that um like I went to go stand up and like I passed out but when I spoke to the person that pretty much I would say saved my life she said no she said no you was in the car like you was like slumped over and we thought you know like you had a seizure or something so and and what's so crazy is I could remember so vividly me getting out the car and like it was like I could tell you every detail about me getting out the car but I never got out the car yeah I don't know it's I don't know and then and then also I seen the lights too but the lights came from I guess whenever I came back to, um, I was on the operating table. So they said, and I told them I was I was cold, and then they was just like, "Well, you shouldn't be because we was warming up the table because we've been expecting you." And after that, I didn't wake up for three weeks. So that's crazy because we all got these little things that kind of are like similar in ways. So like we can all kind of relate in some way. Yeah. So it's crazy that you say that, but then at the same time, it's you're only eight years old when you're going through this. So I know for you, it, it just, it really had to be just terrifying for you because like you're eight years old at this time, you know? So, yeah. Okay. Okay. So do you know from the time that you go into surgery to the time you wake up, do you know how long that was? Two weeks. Oh my God. Two weeks. Whew, that's a long time. Yeah. I, when I woke up, um, I was I was covered in tubes. I couldn't mm. um, talk because yeah. of the tube that they had, you know, down my throat. Um, mm-hmm. So anytime that I needed to speak, um, they had given me a board to write on. So that was my way of communicating after the shooting. Okay, okay so I'm pretty sure you had a trach in this. Did you have a trach in? No. I don't I know a... what tube they had down my throat, but... Two, okay, okay, okay. Because I didn't have a my mine was kind of similar, but it's because I had a tray can. Yeah, and I and I couldn't talk, so I literally had to communicate the same way, writing on a board. Or, I mean, at that time, that's when you learn that people can't read lips. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. Damn. Do you? It's like. It's some things I want to ask you, but I feel like that, you know, just, just you being eight years old, I don't feel like that you would really know what time. Okay. If you can remember, what types of machines was you on at the time? I, you know? I don't remember. You know? Exactly. Okay. Okay. So when the bullet hit your, did the, did the bullet hit your spine? Um, the bullet didn't hit my spine. It was the, one of the, fra- the fragments because there was, there wasn't an exit wound for one of the bullets. Okay. Um, so it's like now, whenever I get like X-rays, um, mm-hmm. it kind of like lights up on the, on the on the X-ray picture. Okay, so the fragment is still in there. Yeah, it was too much for them to take out. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Damn, that sucks. That sucks because, you know, I talked to people where their spine wasn't hit. Like my spine wasn't hit. It was just a shock wave that really just collapse one of my vertebrae yeah so but but then like i tell you you know like it's unfortunate but when bullets go in or hit something sometimes they don't stop they just keep traveling and that's what it seems like in your case it probably was like a hollow point and as soon as it hit you it probably just exploded or like part of it like just chipped off and went somewhere else and the other part came out so that's crazy okay so at what moment do you realize that you're paralyzed? Um, when they tried sitting me up for the first time, it's just like, um, it's like I, my whole body was weak. I, I was kind of like a baby, you know, starting over yeah. all over again. Um, yeah. the first time that they put me in a chair, I didn't want to be in it. I cried. I screamed. 
and they would force me to be in that chair. I didn't want to be in it. Yeah. And it's like in, you know, um, from the time that I wake up, um, or from the time of the shooting, and then um, from the time of the shooting to the point when I actually woke up, they couldn't bathe me. So me waking up, I still had all that blood in my hair. Yeah. 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 Mm. You know, it's unfortunate, but it's really unfortunate because so many of our stories you know, getting to the hospital and after is so relatable, you know, because I couldn't get bathed either. Like everything was like, just like bed baths, but it was like the foam stuff. Oh yeah. You know, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't like it was, I was using water and stuff. It was foam. It was foam. And then like, they kind of like wiped it off. So I was, I was covered in like, I don't know, just like scabs and then blood and like, I, I got stunk. So it, it, it was, it was really horrible. So, I don't really want to get into it because at the same time, like you're, you're only eight years old having to go through that. So I, I, I feel like me and a lot of people out there that can relate, we kind of understand what you went through in yeah. a way, you know, but at the same time, I feel like I don't kind of really understand what you went through because you were so young. Yeah. And I feel like that's I feel like that that's the hardest thing to try to really relate to because I was twenty two. I was twenty two and I got in a wheelchair. Yeah. You know? So to only be eight years old. <sighs> All right. Um and also when you said it's it's crazy because I never looked at it like that. You said it, it was like you was a child all over again. Yeah. You know, you know, because you were just so weak. You know, just you being in just you being in a coma for those two weeks, like it's crazy how weak the body can get just over just a matter of two weeks. Yeah. You and know, I mean I, it was it was frustrating for me because it's like in because I was in the hospital for six months. Um, because my I kept having to um have back surgeries over and over again. Mm. Um, they ended up putting a metal rod in my back and they thought that my body had rejected it. Mm -hmm. So I got super sick. Um, they ended up taking it back out. Um, so it's just like, I was pretty much back and forth. It's like, I'd have a back surgery, you know, um, or I'd be in physical therapy and I'd start learning how to do things on my own. And then I'd get sick or something. And then I'd have to have the rod taken out. And it's like, it was a cycle. Damn. Okay, now when you said that you were getting sick, what types of symptoms were you having? Um, I think I was just running fevers. Makes sense. Um, but um you know, it's just it's crazy to think about being so young. It's like my daughter is just yeah. two years away from the age that I was when I got shot. It's really kind of tough to even try to grasp it. Like just, just the thought of it is, is really hard to deal with. So, yeah. Okay. So, in total, do you know how many surgeries that you had to go through as far as like back surgeries? And, um, no, I don't know, but I know that before every surgery, um, I would cry. And I would count how many surgeries that I was having, you know, back to back. And I lost count after eight. But um, as far as the my body rejecting the rod that they initially put in, I um, it wasn't it ended up not even being my um, rod that my body was um, rejecting. It was um, one of the bullets had punctured a hole in, in my intestines. So they had to go in and I guess they sewed, sewed that up and mm -hmm. um, I was better after that. Mm -hmm. So you, so you probably was having like some, like minor internal bleeding then. Yeah. Okay. Damn. Okay. So whenever they was going in to do the, 
the back surgeries, do you know what they were trying to fix? No. Like, you don't know what they were trying to fix? Okay. No. Mm. Damn. You said you was in the hospital for six months. Yeah. That's... And it's just my That's... family. It's like my grandmother is my rock. Yeah. Um, every day for those six months, she was there. It's like I really I didn't have any family support. Um, mm-hmm. My parents were young, so mm-hmm. I guess once they knew that I was going to make it, it's like they pretty much built on me. Um, my mom was barely there. My grandma was my advocate, um, signing off on paperwork for surgeries and yeah. stuff like that. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, I did, after physical therapy and stuff, I did go back with my mother for eight years, and I've been on my own since. So I was 16 years old and in a wheelchair doing it by myself. Still managed to go to high school, graduate, and then go to college and graduate. Congrats. Congrats. For real, for real. Damn. Okay. Okay, so... At the time, at the time, do you remember what grade you was in? Second grade. Second, fuck, second grade. Yeah, and my second grade teacher, um, I actually still keep in contact with her. Um, I haven't seen her in a couple of years, you know, but it was important for me to have her meet my daughter. Um, and she was the first person that I asked for when I woke mm. up. And, you know, they took all the tubes out. That's who I wanted is my teacher. And she was there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I I feel like sometimes a lot of people don't realize how much of an impact a good teacher can have. Yeah. You know. And then at the same time, a lot of people don't realize. Well, you know, I think a lot of people do realize how much how much a bad teacher can have an impact in your life. Yeah, because I feel like I I feel like I experienced both of them, but it seems like that you experienced, you know, even at a young age, you know, eight years old in the second grade. It's crazy that you have a connection with a teacher that you know. You wake up from a coma, you know, you get these tubes taken out, and that's what you're asking for. Yeah. You know, it's it's truly it's it's truly a beautiful thing, you know. So, okay, so. What months does this happen? April. Like, what month does this happen? April, okay. Yeah, the anniversary is actually coming up on the 20th. On what day? April 20th. April 20th. 94. Damn, okay. And at that time, drive-by shootings and just in all over San Antonio were bad. Like, they were going block by block by block by block. And when it got to our street, you just didn't, you know, you just never think that something like that is going to happen to you. And I know that I've read in the newspaper that that year, drive-by shootings, uh, or, you know, my city was uh, the, mm-hmm. well, I wrote it down. It was a drive-by capital of Texas in 94. Yeah. And I was the sole survivor of drive-by shootings that year and the youngest. So, um, it's like, I've gotten so much support from the city, um, Mm -hmm. opportunities just for me, like as far as, you know, graduating from college and and stuff like that. Um, okay. Okay. Okay, Now, because the shooting happened in April and the reason why I asked that was because I was wondering about your school year. Was you able to go to the next grade? I was able to go to the next grade, but I couldn't finish out the school year i had i think i had a teacher going into the hospital oh okay so you okay so she was pretty much like tutoring you kind of like yeah and te- okay 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 it's it's tough wanting to ask you so many questions because you know you're a grown woman talking to me but everything that we're talking about happened when you was eight years old and I feel like that's I feel like that's the tough part. So everything that I want to ask you, 
It's not that I'm asking an eight. It's not. It's not that I'm asking an eight year old. But I don't know. It's. I don't know. I don't know. It's just really tough to really. I don't, I, I don't know. Just mentally, it's really hard to kind of deal with, you know. So. As like as far as like wanting to just ask you stuff. How is physical therapy for you? It was hard. I did a lot of crying. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just didn't want to be in the chair. And then, like I said, it's frustrating having to do surgery after surgery and then learning how to redo everything all over again. Mm. <sighs> yeah. And I would say that's what I would probably think that you would have to do if you, if you had a surgery... I feel like that you would probably go back to um, like like zero. So you probably would have to, you know, do everything again, learn, like sit up again, like, mm. okay. But it's something that I've gotten used to. I mean, even as an adult, like my last back yeah. surgery was at age 21 because I broke my rod. Um, mm. But it's like something that I was prepared for as an adult. I can't imagine mm. how I got through what I got through as a child. And as you say that, I feel like that many people watching right now can probably feel the same way. Damn. Okay. Okay, so when you get out the hospital, you're going into your third grade year, correct? Yes. Okay. So has the school year already started at that time? I, I can't remember. You can't remember? Okay. So, if you don't mind me asking, do you remember what your first day of school was like? No. You don't? Okay. How was school in general for you? It was good, but it. it okay. I hated that I was always the person on the sidelines. Um, yeah. Especially just when it would come to certain things that I couldn't do, it's like I had to watch, and yeah. I tried not to let it bother me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's understandable. It... Mm. Yeah. Okay. It. It's really tough. For, it's kind of tough for me to want to ask you questions because I feel like that, you know, I can only just, I can only just think about what I was doing at your age, you know, like going into my third grade school year. Like I, like I, like not that I knew exactly what I was doing, but I, I like I could kind of, I could kind of remember like little bits and pieces. So just, just to know what you were going through at that age, you know, at the same age as me. I, I just really couldn't imagine it. I, I know that um, once um, I started school, um, one memory that I do have was, um, I guess, when I was in PE, um, you know, I, I guess the coach was bothered by the fact that I was just sitting watching everybody jumping rope and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And he had gotten a jump rope and he laid it across the ground. And um, he's like, I'm going to put this across the ground. He's all like, and then you just pop a wheelie over it. That'll be your version of jumping yeah. rope. Okay. At the time, did you know how to pop a wheelie? Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. What do you think the, the toughest thing that you had to face while going through school, while being in a wheelchair? watching everybody do the things that I couldn't do. And it's simple stuff. Like, you know, um, you're in middle school yeah. and you see a hallway of, or a, a walkway leading to stairs and it's like... Yeah. Did you have elevators at your school? Yeah, we did.
How was high school for you? High school was good. Um, I'm, I was pretty much, I guess, like a loner. I mean, I was talkative, but I pretty much, I just kept to myself, got stuff done, and mm. that was pretty much it. How was it making friends? I mean, I, I'm kind of talkative. Um, so, I mean, it was okay. easy for me to make friends, but a lot of people, I think, were just kind of drawn to me because the high, the high school that I went to would actually mm-hmm. post articles in the school newspaper about me getting shot and, you know, me being, you know, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior in high school. Mm, okay, so everybody pretty much already knew your story. Yeah. To where you didn't even have to say it. Okay. Exactly. If you don't mind me asking, because I'm, I'm not curious, but I know the people are curious. How was your dating life going through, going through school? Did you date at all? No. You didn't date at all. No. Mm, is it is it because you didn't want to, or is just nobody really approached you? And nobody really approached me like that. Mm. Did you want to date? No, not really. Um, I just, I guess I was focused on myself and just yeah. bettering myself as a person. Mm-hmm. Okay. I feel like, you know, because I feel like that only really people in wheelchairs in I would say maybe caregivers can relate to what we got to go through. And let me see. It's it's like, it's not that it's things that I want to ask you, but I guess it, it, I guess it's things that I'm like, it's like curious about, you know, because you're going through high school. So I'm just, I'm just, or, like you're going through middle school, high school. I just want to know how was it keeping up with your schedule? Like how was that? How was that for you? What do you mean? Okay. You know what we go through as far as like bow care, Catherine, and stuff like that. Yeah. How was it? How was it with you keeping up with your schedule as far as like with school and everything? Like during the day, you know, being young, just. Yeah, when I came to self caffeine and stuff like that, I mean, I was Mm -hmm. already doing that on my own, and I, you know, Mm -hmm. was on that schedule where I'd go every three to four hours, just to go to the bathroom like any other normal person. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, then. Okay, so, when you graduate high school, do you have any plans? No, not really. I just wanted to travel. I just wanted to Travel. travel. Yeah. Okay. And where'd you want to travel to? Anywhere but Texas. Anywhere but Texas. Yeah. Okay. Have you traveled anywhere but Texas? Yes. Where have you gone? Um, I've been to Savannah, Georgia, um, Ooh, Panama City, okay. Florida, Orlando. Okay. Um, what is it? Uh, Santa Monica, California. Okay. Uh, Seattle. Mm, okay. Rain State. Okay. Mm. okay. And where do you want to go? Like... I guess, I guess, like, what's some of your bucket list stuff? Some of my bucket list stuff. Yes. Go, go to Paris. Give us the good stuff. Oh, okay. okay. Italy. The Louvre. Okay. Yeah, I've never gone international. Okay. So that's on the okay. bucket list. Okay, it's on the bucket list? All yeah. Right. Now, when you went to these places, did you go by plane, train, car? Um, I've been through train, and I've also done uh, air. Air? Okay. Yeah. How do you like traveling? I love it. You like... oh. Yeah. How do you like traveling in a wheelchair? I would say like as far as like the travel part aspect, like like the plane ride. How do you like that? It's frustrating. Okay. It's like really frustrating because they the airlines, I mean, yeah. you run into some nice people that are helpful and willing to help you, you as far as like the attendants, but mm-hmm. you get those that are kind of bothered when you ask for anything. Yeah. Um you know, I, with me being on a schedule, it's like, Mm -hmm. I had myself trained, oh, don't drink anything an hour before your flight, you don't Mm want to have to go to the bathroom on the plane, Mm -hmm. um, okay, 
Yeah, and I feel like that that's one thing that the airlines kind of need to work on is if if we need to go to the restroom, we really don't have anywhere to go. Uh, it's not like we can just get in our wheelchair and go. I feel like that. I feel like for the most part, we would probably just have to get a blanket and try to do everything like that. Yeah. But as far as like going to the restroom and cat, uh, like using the restroom, yes. Yeah, I feel like that the airlines need to be a little bit more attentive to people in wheelchairs, and you know, just as far as like maybe where they sit us, or you know, just making something available to where if we need to use the restroom, we can. Yeah. Because we're, we're like. For anybody who's not in a wheelchair, it's going to be hard for you to kind of relate because you can just get up and just go to the restroom. You yeah. can. You know, we can't. And then it's like the whole plane ride. You don't want to drink anything. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's, and then it's hard to travel while mm. having a child and you're a single parent. Mm. Um, I mean, I was lucky enough to, when I traveled with my daughter to Georgia, she was small. Mm. So, okay. you know, she really yeah. didn't have to go to the bathroom or anything mm-hmm. i just wait until to catch the next, the next flight you know to change her but you know now yeah. that she's older we haven't traveled because it's you know my fear is that mm-hmm. she has to go to the bathroom and i can't get up to go with her mm-hmm. yeah okay if you don't mind me asking how old was you when you got pregnant 29 29 okay yeah and okay. you know actually i was also told that I wouldn't be able to have kids Mm. and I was able to get pregnant with her naturally. Okay. Congrats. Yeah. But I mean, pregnancy and being in a wheelchair, it was hard. It was hard. I I was high risk. Um, I was on bed rest. Most of the pregnancy, um, I had to do, uh, Lovenox injections on my stomach. I don't know if you've ever gotten those, like the blood thinners. I did. I did, in the hospital, but I, but they only did that to me when I was in the hospital, though. Yeah, okay. uh, it was it was the yeah that was the first time that I think I've ever had to do that from home was during the pregnancy. I think it was mm. they had switched up my medication. I think one was every eight hours and or one was every twelve hours. But I mean, even though the needle was small, those hurt and they leave big bruises. Yes. And were those the ones that you get in, like, your stomach, like, right there? Like, right in your stomach? In your, like at the in your pelvic area. Okay. Okay, so if you don't mind me asking, where did your sensation start? And stop? Um, where does it start? What level are you, by the way? L4, L5. What level? L4, L5. Okay, so where is that at? Is it's that a power right above low? the tailbone. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, so when you say you was on bed rest for most of the time, yes, does that literally mean that you was on bed rest for, for yeah. like nine months? Yeah, they had to. Um, I mean, once I started getting bigger and they couldn't self cath, um, they had to put a foley in, so I didn't have to get up. Yeah. Okay. All right, and for those of you who watching out there, foley catheter is something that they pretty much just. Uh, put inside you and it pretty much allows you to, to like I, don't know, I guess like relieve yourself like naturally like not naturally but it just it does it for you pretty much it just goes into like a bag so that's for anybody who's just really curious out there watching um damn nine months how was how was that mentally it was depressing and it was more like I don't know. I'm a knee freak, so I always have to be up cleaning, and that was my thing, and I just, I couldn't mm-hmm. get up to really do anything. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it's like, you just get stuck in your thoughts. Yep. But I guess because I've gotten therapy, and you know, mm-hmm. a year before I had my daughter, I did go and get treatment. Um, mm-hmm. I ended up getting diagnosed with um, major depressive disorder. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's controlled with, you know, medication and, um, yeah. what is it? What's the other one? PTSD. Okay. Yeah. Um, I right. guess yeah. back then, um, you know, when I was eight, they weren't really diagnosing people with that. Um, yeah. because usually it's more the people that 
were in the armed forces that would get diagnosed yeah. with that. Um, but there were signs of me mm -hmm. having PTSD back then because I couldn't um, hear fireworks. Um, mm -hmm. A car backfiring would scare yeah. me. Um, and yeah, I mean, it just, it, it sucked. It sucked because you couldn't really participate in certain holidays because you, you would be scared and it's more like my body would just go numb and I'd just start shaking. I wouldn't scream or anything, but that was me. I mean, it's gotten a lot better now that I'm older and I have my daughter mm -hmm. as a distraction because I'm focused on what she's doing and how happy she mm -hmm. is when she sees stuff, stuff like that. Okay, then if you don't mind me asking, what age were you when you first got therapy? Um, I think they had started it right after I got shot, but I wasn't ready to talk. Mm. I didn't want to talk about okay. the shooting at all. Okay. Um, the only time anybody would hear me talk about it is um, when... I would speak to the guy from the newspaper because he did yearly articles from 96 to 2006. And then oh, so the they, last they one. They kept up with you frequently. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And what were you going to say? The last one? The last one was two years ago. Okay. Oh. Okay. So it's, they still. Yeah. I'm, uh, the guy from the paper would tell me that I'm like the most asked about. Um, mm hmm. When it comes to his writing. Yeah. Mm. Okay. If you have any links to the articles, you uh, you can send them to me, and then I'll post them in the description box. You know, so people can go read the articles because it, it goes so much further than just this interview. Yeah. You know, like we're only probably going to be able to touch on a couple things. You know, versus these interviews you do every year that you touch on, you know, things that. You know, you probably might forget to say during the interview, or you might overlook, or you might miss, or you just might not even think about saying, you know, or to be honest, you might not even feel comfortable saying it. Yeah. You know, so. Okay. At what age do you feel like you started accepting therapy? It was, it took a long time for me to admit mm -hmm. that there was an issue. Um, yeah. It's like I know that I would get really depressed like my lows especially in my mid to late 20s were like really mm -hmm. low and I mean to be honest with you it's like I'm not a perfect person you know I've mm -hmm. done stuff to not be around anymore and mm -hmm. I think that that's when I knew that there was an issue and I needed to get treatment because I yeah. didn't want to be that person I didn't make it through everything that I went through Mm -hmm. to just be a punk like that like that's not yeah. who i am that's not who my grandma raised me to be mm -hmm. but it's like i think that my daughter was like the light at the end of the tunnel it's like i had to accept yeah. things for what they were before i got what i wanted mm -hmm. and a lot i think that mental health and then at the same time your age you know you said this happened in 94 correct yeah okay so you're eight years old in 94 mental health wasn't something that was really talked about in a house like that you know it wasn't it wasn't something that people talked about so a lot of the times when you get i would say knee deep into a depression you don't even know what's going on yeah. You know, it like I know because I like I, I like not not that we went through like the same thing as far as like I would say like depression, but it's like I can kind of relate. Because like you said, for the longest time I didn't want to admit that there was a problem. Yeah, and I and out. I think and, like, you know, being Hispanic and mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It's like you're kind of a lot of people don't express their feelings yeah. and what they're feeling. And I feel like yeah. 
uh, as far as family, it's like now mm-hmm. because of the therapy that I've gotten, it's so easy for me to talk about yeah. what I've been through. Mm-hmm. And it, it wasn't easy. Yeah. It, just, it, it was hard. Yeah. And until I got therapy, I, w- I was the same way. Um, you know, for guys, we have a, a real... A lot of guys, I ain't going to say all of us, but some of us, we have an ego problem. And your ego will keep you from sharing things with other guys or with anybody else. Because I know that's how it was for me. I didn't share my feelings with anybody else. I didn't tell people what I was going through. I didn't know anything about mental health. Like, I don't even think I even said the words mental health before my incident. Like, I, I didn't know anything about it. You know, and in the black community, because I'm black and Puerto Rican. So in the black community, mental health isn't something that's really even taught in the home. It's not something that's spoke about. My parents didn't speak to me about it. And I would say it's probably because they didn't really know anything about it. So it's, you know, it's really hard to, you know, try to recommend something to somebody who, you know, they probably don't even have any knowledge of it. Yeah, and I mean, it it was hard because it's like now that I'm aging and I'm getting older, Mm -hmm. pain-wise, it's bad. Like, the muscle spasms get bad. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just like when I get them, I could just feel my whole body shaking. Um, I know that that's something that I had to deal with while going to school, but it's something Mm -hmm. that I would hold in or ask to go to the bathroom just to get through that muscle spasm that I was having Mm -hmm. because I wanted to break down a lot of the time. It's like, I remember, you know, going to college and holding it in. I was hurting and I would want to cry, but I would just hold myself together and just say, no, I'm going to get through this. Like, (sighs) where'd you get your major? Criminal justice. Criminal justice. Okay. Did you use it at all? No, I haven't. Okay. Do you plan on using it? Yes. Okay. And what do you want to do? Really, it's always been my goal. I I want to go to law school. That's like For real? my goal. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm. You know what? I always wanted to go to law school too because I feel like I I just like arguing. I can argue my case. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. and I'm so quick with my words. I feel like. Mm. Um, it's just something that comes natural when it comes to case files and reading all that stuff. Mm-hmm. It's like, ooh, what happened next? Like, I have to keep reading. Mm. Okay. Um, I've also reached out, you know, because um, being from Texas, there's so many okay. shootings now. It seems mm-hmm. like it's happening, you know, more than once a day. Yeah. And I remember them being bad back in the day, but now it's just mm-hmm. it's worse. And I've actually reached out to people who have been through the same thing. You know, I've helped people with, like, okay. um, their victims' impact statements because it's something that I had to do. Okay. Mm-hmm. Of, um, and, when you say, and when you say a victim impact statement, what is that for the people listening? It's a letter that you write to the parole board um, whenever um, the person or the offender um, is about to be released from prison. Okay, so the person that shot up the house, he was eventually caught? All five of them were. Oh, my God. All five. But oh they were God. only charged with um, assault with a deadly weapon. Okay. They were minors. Mm. Um, the main one, I guess, the one that planned it out, um, he got five years. Damn. But currently... Um, he's in jail for unrelated charges, but I still mm-hmm. get um, letters from the parole board every time he's up for parole for committing like a serious crime. I mean, he's kept that lifestyle. So every yeah. year when he's up for parole until the day that I mm-hmm. die and he keeps getting in trouble, I'm going to write those letters because there's no sure. way that I want somebody out on the streets. You know, I, if I could prevent him from being out there and hurting people the way that he hurt me and my family, mm-hmm. yeah. but then that's what I'm going to do because it's like I've been through so much. Like, yeah. and it's just like um, his words, like he didn't, he didn't care. He didn't care that he shot up our house. 
his words were, um, I feel bad for her, but I'm never going to say I'm sorry. And I was only eight years old. Like, he just, he didn't care. Yeah, he's, he ain't have no remorse. Yeah, and I know for the other ones, you know, I remember still being young and going to court. And for some reason, I don't know why, I felt guilty. Like, I felt bad yeah. for being in that courtroom. It's like, I know that s some of them did what they did, but I felt guilty that I was taking them away from their family. Mm. Yeah. Um, I know I have that's, memories that's of that. being in court and mm -hmm. they wouldn't look at me. Mm. Um, Probably because they just felt guilt. Just so much guilt. You know, maybe, my, my grandmother, maybe he didn't feel guilt, but they probably felt guilt. My grandmother yeah. actually flew out to one of the prisons um, that one of mm -hmm. them was at to talk to him, and he apologized. But my grandmother said that he was he didn't seem sincere. sincere. He mm -hmm. was just saying yeah. what, just not the truth. Yeah. And were your grandma's intentions to go out there and speak to him? Yes. It, it was actually mm -hmm. on the news. Um, I don't remember it, but I have tried looking for it online and I, I can't mm -hmm. find it. Okay. Okay. Because I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious about that. Um, who set this up? It was the news because they followed my story. And did the news station come to you and ask you, did you want to speak to them? I don't think I ever spoke to them. The only thing that I ever did was um, speak to the guy from the newspaper. You're the first person well, that I've, like I said, I've ever spoken to about mm -hmm. this as an adult. But even as a child, I just, I wasn't ready to talk. Mm, that's understandable. Okay. What were your thoughts on your grandma going out there to go speak to the guy? I don't know. I was scared, but at the end of the day, my mm -hmm. grandmother is a strong yeah. person. Um, mm -hmm. I just I don't know how she could face him. I mm -hmm. back then. Yeah. And this wasn't the this wasn't the guy that shot you. No, this was just one of this was just one of them that was in that the served car. a year. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hold on. You said he only served a year. Yeah. Four of them, four out of the five only served one year. Um, you know, the prosecutor for the case had said that there was never a weapon found. So they couldn't really charge him with much. I think the only reason that it um their names were out there was because I guess one of them got in trouble for something and he snitched the other ones out to plea bargain. Mm. I mean, okay. It's not like somebody dropped the ball. <sighs> okay. Because so much time has passed, Do you think that you could ever face the guy that shot you? Yes. Okay. If you could, what would you say? Why? Yeah. Okay. I'm, yeah. I'm pretty, yeah. I'm pretty sure that would be most people's question. You know, and I feel like if that day ever came is, I feel like it would be on him as far as like, he would, he would, he would really have to change his life around to give you a legit answer to your question. Do you ever feel like later on down the line that you would reach out? No. No. Okay. What are your thoughts towards him? The main ones? 
I'm trying not to. I mean, uh, you, you don't have to share if you don't want to. It's fine. <laughs> the main one, my to. thoughts on him is there's not really. I, I'm trying not to hold in that anger towards him because it's not good to hold in that type of energy. But at mm-hmm. the end of the day, when he's not around anymore, he's going to be the one suffering in the end. Like, yeah. It's like he made his bed so he can lie in it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so you said that you you've reached out to many people that's, you know, been in your situation or something similar. Do you reach out to a lot of people? No, I haven't done it in a while. I would do it when I was in college, you know, cases that we would Mm -hmm. follow. Um, Stuff that was in the news. Yeah. Okay. Um, some would um, message back, some wouldn't. Mm-hmm. Um, but the ones that have, you know, it's like I've given them copies of my victim's impact statement. Mm-hmm. So that way it's kind of, I mean, it's really detailed. Yeah. So, I mean, it's something to mm-hmm. use. Yeah. And what are your thoughts on people that don't reply back? They're just not ready to talk, you just like I yeah. wasn't. Exactly. So, I mean, exactly. I, I can't fault them for it. Yeah. And I definitely understand where you're coming from because, you know, I, I try, I don't reach out to everybody. I reach out to some people. Like, as far as, like, like for the people that people might tell me about, like, hey, uh, like maybe you should interview this person or just somebody that I might have knowledge of or somebody that's been following me for a while, you know, I'll try to reach out or, you know, like maybe I might come across a page from like something that um, was on like the Explorer page or something. But I definitely understand when you say maybe they're just not ready because I was one of those ones who wasn't ready. And if somebody reached out to me to talk about my story, if somebody like me, reached out to me to talk about my story probably four years four years into me being into a wheelchair I probably wouldn't have talked about it yeah like and I really commend you and everybody else that has came on my podcast to to really talk about this story because I truly don't know if I can really go on somebody's podcast and really talk about my story I don't like I don't know if I'm scared or I like like I don't like I don't know because it bothers it bothers me in a way, and it's something that I don't, I don't really get to talk about. Like, I might throw hints out there to my wife, but I don't really get to talk about it, you know. And I don't know. Like sometimes I just feel like that maybe y'all are just stronger than me. Um, but I feel like that you know as I do as I, as I do these podcast interviews, y'all literally get stuff out of me that I would never talk about, you know. So just as much as so many of y'all tell me that these interviews help y'all out. These interviews truly help me out. Yeah, and it's like I messaged you um, last night, and it's like the stories that you're doing are really going to change the world. Like, I think, you know, with me speaking or, you know, the reason why I messaged you because I just want people to know at the end of the day there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Like, Mm -hmm. it may be hard and, you know, it's not always easy, but, yeah, you know, you can make it through whatever. Exactly. And and that's something that it took me a while to realize. You know, it took me it took me years to really realize that you could go on living, you know, and really have a good life. You know, you could really eat like I don't know, I, I, I didn't feel like I didn't feel like that I could really impact the world from a wheelchair. You know. But now but now I see that that, that wasn't true. Yeah. You know, just your message last night, like I literally showed my wife because like it really mean it really means a lot to me because, you know, I was always the one like I, I just never really wasn't passionate about anything. Like I, I just really like like no matter what I did, I just I wasn't passionate about a lot of uh, like nothing really. Nothing and like but I would tell people like I would never like I would never give up because Not that I, not that I'm okay with failing, 
but you never truly fail unless you give up. Yeah. So I'm willing to go through a million things to find that one thing that I'm good at or that one thing that I'm passionate about. Yeah. You know, I've done done so many different things on YouTube to to land on this one thing that I'm truly passionate about because you, like y'all you guys' stories help me out so much. And I know just just me telling you you like like you're probably not understanding it, but it really truly helps me out and I like you know hopefully one day somebody can interview me on this podcast and I can tell my story yeah you know so that's my goal like that's truly one of my goals is to be able to get on here just like how you got on here and and really just say everything so I like your journey is truly inspirational thank you but because it's unfortunate because I'm pretty sure you wasn't the first, and I'm pretty sure you're not going to be the last. And that's sad. And it's, it's, it's such really a sad. sad. It, it really is. And it it really sucks because this community grows by the day. You know, and it, it, it's really kind of hard to fathom that. You know, it, I'm pretty sure every day somebody has a SCI injury. Somebody ends up in a wheelchair, you know, but it's on us to really get the the knowledge out there and the information out there to, to, to really try to help people because I know how lost somebody can feel those first couple years, you know, and I really can't relate. I really can't relate to you because you was only eight years old having to go through that. Yeah. And like I said, the youngest person that I didn't spoke to that this has happened to was 13. So that's, that's a five year gap right there. It's, it's a lot. It might not seem like it, you know, you know, when you get older, five years go by like that, but as a kid, five years is a lifetime. Yeah. You know, so <sighs> what, what advice would you give to somebody that's newly paralyzed? Doesn't have to be a woman, doesn't it? could be a man or woman. There's gonna what be, advice would you give them? There's going to be so many hardships along your new journey. Mm-hmm. And just whatever you do, don't give up. And I feel like that that's something that most people need to hear. There's there's definitely going to be a lot of ups and downs. And, you know, like we were speaking on before, I feel like everybody needs to sit down and talk to somebody at some point. Yeah. You know? Um, dealing with being in a wheelchair, I feel like it's something that we should all do. Because... It's probably a lot of things that we're holding in. I'm pretty sure it's a lot of stuff that if I was to sit down and talk to somebody right now, I probably wouldn't let out. Yeah. You know, but I try to, I I try. I try. And I would say I'm going to keep trying until they actually come out. And I can say that that's one thing that, that I'm doing is that I'm trying. Um, because I've been, I've been in a situation where, I literally had to go to a a mental health institution. Like, I literally had to go. Yeah, I had to do the same thing. And it really helped to be around a lot of people that were going through the same thing. And I think that that's what got me into Mm -hmm. actually speaking. Because I feel like after I did that, I was good. Yeah. I was good. I let everything out, you know, with the one-on-one counseling, the the group therapy, Mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And the crazy thing about it is that's exactly what helped me out too. I, as much as I didn't want to be there, as much as I fought not to go there, going there was one of the best things that could have happened to me because it wasn't the first time I went. Um, it was, I think it was like the second time. And it, it, it changed my life for the better. Um, I was just holding in so much. I was I was holding in so much and 
when I finally got into those group sessions, I was able to just lay it all on the table. And I felt like I, I felt like I was doing it for the wrong reasons at first because when I first got there, they were telling me they're not going to let you go if you don't talk. They're not going to let you go if you don't talk. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to get up in there and I'm going just, to just let it all out. And that's what I did. And it was so therapeutic because I was able to really just get off my chest what I had been feeling for so long. The things that I really couldn't talk to anybody about, it, it was like, I, I, don't know, I felt like I was just finally talking to somebody that would listen. Yeah. And not 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 necessarily relate, but I felt like I was finally talking to somebody that, that I knew could help me out. Yeah. Do you still go to therapy? Yes, I do. Do you go frequently? Um, I just call in whenever I'm going through something. Okay. Okay. But it's like mm-hmm. the lows that I had back then are, it's mm-hmm. just now they're so much minor. Um, yeah. I think being in a wheelchair as a parent, mm-hmm. like now has changed me. And the only thing that bothers me is mm-hmm. seeing my daughter, like seeing me in pain. And her there, like, asking, um, Mom, do you need some water? Mm -hmm. Or going to the park with her, and it's like, in your head, you're thinking, God, I wish, I wish I could be running with her. Like, I wish, you know, when she's sick, I could, you know, just go and stand up and carry her. Like, I miss out on all those experiences, but I'm so grateful. Like, I'm great. I'm so grateful for the life. Mm -hmm that I brought into this world because my daughter is the one that's helping me get through everything. She made me a stronger person. Mm -hmm. And it's just crazy. The moment that, you know, you have a child, like how much you're in love with something so much that Mm -hmm. you just had. At what age do you feel like that you had to break it to her as far? Like, have you ever told her what happened to you? No. Okay. Um, my daughter, uh, she was just diagnosed with um, autism. Um, okay. She's on the lower end of the spectrum. She's really smart. Mm-hmm. So her kind of understanding, um, stuff like that now, she doesn't fully understand. Okay. Okay. All she knows is, you know, what she sees. Um, I know that when it came to small things like potty training, Mm -hmm. her normal was, um, you know, seeing me cap, you know, walking into the bathroom and and seeing me do that. Like that's was, Mm -hmm. that was her normal. But um, now it's like, you know, she's learning. How old are you right now? I am 36. 36. Yeah. Okay. So you've been in a wheelchair for... It's about to be 28 28 years. years. 28 years. Through that whole 28-year journey, what do you feel was the hardest thing that you had to overcome? Talking to my family. Like, I just, I held everything in for so long. I think the hardest thing, it's like, I because I'm like a very strong old person. It's mm-hmm. like, I knew that I could get everything. I could get through everything, but talking mm-hmm. about it was the hardest part of the journey, especially yeah. when it came to being family, especially when they're kind of like closed off. Yeah. But... Just when the, con- say, huh? oh, sorry, the conversations oh, no. oh, with no, certain people, um, when they hear my words, it's like I just, you know, had a talk last night, yeah. and um, I don't blame anybody for anything that's ever happened to me. And if I could redo 
that night all over again, I'd still pick me to get shot because I know the way that I am and I was strong enough out of all the people in that house to take that bullet or those four bullets. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah. I just, I would do it over and over and over again if it meant that yeah. everybody else in that house was okay. Mm -hmm. And because of what you mentioned, do you feel like that the hardest part for them is taking accountability? Yeah. Okay. And do you feel like that separates the family at all? Yeah. The shooting broke the family. We all used to be super close and everybody just went their own separate ways. Um, after the shooting, we, or my family didn't even go back for their stuff. They left everything behind and started all over again. So y'all never went back to the house? No. What? That's crazy. I feel like I'm the only one um, now that I'm an adult that has actually gone back to that house. But now that I've seen it, it's like that house holds so much negative energy. I don't think that I would ever go yeah. back. Yeah. Do you know how many... Do you know how many times in total, like, do you know how many shots they let off? Um, I think what I read in the newspaper was 40. 40? Yeah. Damn. Damn. That's, that's crazy. Whew. I feel like that, you know, your story somebody's going to hear the story and they're going to be able to relate. And I feel like just them saying how strong of a person that you are, I feel like that that's going to, that's truly going to help them out. Yeah. Because you're sitting here talking to you. I can, I can see how strong of a person you are. And, you know, to have this happen to you so young, It's truly amazing to really just, uh, just really see how, how just well that you're really, how well you're really put together, yeah. Mentally, j just mentally, because I I know that that's something, that's a life changing event. Life, like your life, would never be the same from that day. Yeah. And to see all that you've accomplished, you know, from having a child to elementary school, middle school, high school, college. That's truly amazing, you know. And I'm pretty sure we def we, hey, look, we all look forward to you using that criminal justice degree, all right? Yeah. <laughs> all right, and trust me, look, look, you can do it out there. If you still want to go to law school, you could do it, all right? Yeah. All right. You got any plans to do it soon or what? What's going on with that? Um, The plan was to wait until my daughter... Um, started okay. school and she's going to be starting school in the fall i just need to um enroll mm. okay but um having to go with okay. uh it's just the scheduling is hard right now like yeah. i would do summer classes but i have okay beach therapy ot um and she's supposed mm. to start a uh, physical therapy so it's okay. just mom life yeah. is busy mom life okay all right and do you have any advice that you would recommend to to any other moms out there that are paralyzed? It's hard, but in the long run, it's like you're going to look back and see everything you overcame, and it's going to be worth it. The lows mm -hmm. don't stay forever. Yeah, they don't. They don't. That's something that I really had to... And it's and it's okay like to be at your low and to talk about it because there's mm -hmm. no way that sometimes... like There's no way that people can get through like certain things on their own. They just, they need to speak. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I feel like that that's something that most people don't understand. I feel like that a lot of us feel like that we can get through it on our own, you know, cause I felt like that for so long. I felt like that I could get through it by myself. And once I finally realized that it was a problem, I could not shut up. Like I literally just had to get it out. Like I, like, and it's like I wouldn't stop. Like 
it was a good thing. Like, like as far as like me not being able to shut up, it was like, like I feel like I communicate so well with my wife. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, t- I tell her how I'm feeling everything. And I, I wouldn't have been able to do that if it wasn't what I went through. Um, but a lot of people feel like that, you know, we can get through it by ourselves or, you know, just not talking about it. I feel like that a lot of people just feel like if they avoid it, then they'll just go away. And it's not, it's not like that for most stuff. It, you know, it's, it's not really good to harbor stuff. Yeah. You know, it, it it's really not. Um, but whew, I feel, I feel like this interview went like, it just went kind of deep. Yeah. Um, Whew. Yes. And that's why I wanted to be so open, um, because you just mm-hmm. really don't hear people talking about like their lows, you know, things yeah. that they've been diagnosed with, and it's yeah. okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's why I said I, I truly commend everyone that comes on here because it's truly beautiful to see. I talk about, I would say, most of the time probably the worst thing that they had to endure their whole life they're coming on and sharing it with the world you know but i feel like that for most people y'all truly realize that your story could truly help somebody out there yeah it, you know a lot of times it's bigger than us it's it's bigger than just you and that's something that i had to realize when it came to me sharing my story me showing different things on how I went about my life, bow care, how I calf, how I drive, just, you know, all that stuff. I had to realize that it was bigger than me. And, you know, if I, like, me just, me getting that information out there was way bigger than my little ego, Yeah, I guess, you know. Um, and like I said, the information that, that you shared today like I said, unfortunately, you're not the first and you're not going to be the last. So this, so somebody's going to share this interview with somebody that truly needs to hear it. Yeah. And like I said, I really appreciate you coming on talking to me. Thank you. Um, yeah. yeah. Do you have any questions that you want to ask me? Thank you. Anything. Um, anything, anything you want to ask? Do anything. you suffer from muscle spasms at all? Muscle um, No. I would say like maybe like in my back maybe, but I don't think so. Like I don't have any I don't have any spasms in my legs because my my injury was a complete injury. So like, uh, are you a complete or incomplete? I don't know. You don't know, and you want to know? I hear that a lot. Most people don't know, and I and I feel like that most most I wouldn't say most of us, but some of us we don't really understand our injury. I feel like that we try to avoid even bringing it up as far as like maybe to like the doctor. I feel like we know like just the basic stuff about it. Like maybe like what level of injury we are, but I feel like I feel like we don't dive into it as much as we should. Yeah. Um because I know I know that that's definitely the case with me. I just know I'm I'm T10 T11 and that's pretty much it. Can't tell you nothing else. Nothing else. I don't know anything. I don't I don't if if, if I was to look at the spinal column I wouldn't even be able to tell you where that's at. Yeah, I would. I would probably just uh, maybe the belly button's right around there, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> but um, look, look, like I said, I really appreciate you coming onto my podcast, sharing your story. Oh, um, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And just uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let's stay on here for a little bit because I need the, I actually need the thing to finish uploading. Okay. <laughs> because, uh, if you, if you leave off, it won't upload as much, but, um, like I said, look, I really appreciate you really coming on for real, for real, because I feel, <clears throat> why did you want to come on? Because I thought that my story would help other people. I was ready to talk. Really? I was ready to talk. You ready to talk? Yeah. Um, I think um, I actually messaged you, like, I think we before, like, um, you started doing the the podcast. Really? Yeah. Okay. What'd you say? 
I don't remember, but I remember. You don't remember? No. Okay. But I think it, I don't know. I think it had something to do with, you know, you doing something like this. Okay. Okay. Yeah, man. 